Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Basic Income Show. I am Scott Santons, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Conrad Shaw and Josh Worth. We'll be talking about recent happenings in the world of, of basic income. Bring in that intro music. This intro music is AI generated. Love it or hate it, no one was compensated. One more artist One is where their money will come from One more example Of the need for basic income I'm really glad that's the one we ended with. Uh, we, did, we did a bunch of versions. This is my favorite. I think it works the best. <laughs> yeah, the fun thing is we can always do some, you know, continual iterations with newer versions yeah, and stuff. We'll too. mix it up. Why not? Let's see. The first thing we should talk about today. Let's, uh, let's start out with the fact that I just sent out a fresh newsletter i like the newsletter a lot by the way scott i think this is very helpful it's like the night this is like the perfect amount of information that i can consume in one sitting so (laughs) (laughs) yeah no it's like i I designed it around kind of my own tastes i i just Mm -hmm. i I can't stand like a newsletter that has 20 or 30 things in it uh it really just needs to be like five or six and yeah uh, so yeah if people are interested in, in subscribing to this uh, you can find it at uh, it's a newsletter dot beehive dot com, or you can go to it's a foundation dot org, and you'll find um, both at the very bottom of the page. You can subscribe, but also now there's a new button at the top where uh, you can find previous newsletters and just sign up for, for that there. And for those watching who um, maybe don't know, uh, in terms of our roles. Um, like I call myself the UBI guy, but a lot of people think of Scott as the UBI guy because he's, he's the accumulator of all information everywhere. So they'll ask me about data from like, what do you think about this pilot or that pilot or that? And I'm like, uh, I get my news from Scott. So if you, <laughs> if you want to feel like you're tapped into stuff, follow one of Scott's newsletters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's everybody's favorite source of UBI information. Thanks. But uh, yeah, so. Just a few tidbits here in um, in the, the latest newsletter, and I figured we can just cover one of them because uh, I don't want to like just do like a whole newsletter show, but um, just do just to kind of give people uh, an idea of of what this newsletter is about and just uh, you know bigger news thing. So that would be covering the huge three year two state basic income pilot, you know, that released its results. And so I break that down here, um, and which is where each of the newsletters always have the bullet points and then just a few um, major things about each of those. But um, the link is to the article that I wrote about this. It's a big summary of it. So let's just go into these results for a little bit. Um, you, there's like been like a bunch of articles written about this already. And you know, you've got people... Um, just completely kind of ignoring the results and and just saying you know it's another success and and all that and uh, as normal uh, kind of like, like ignoring the the work reduction stuff. But then there's also ones who are completely over exaggerating the work reduction stuff. And there's just a lot of nuance to this pilot. And it was you know it's a it's a large pilot. It's not something to ignore. Um, but the context of the pilot is really important to understand. Um, this is Sam Altman's open research pilot. This was a three-year pilot. Uh, there was a thousand people receiving a thousand dollars a month uh, for for these three years uh, in two different states. Uh, this was Texas and Illinois, and then the control group was two thousand. Uh, people in each of these states too, and so that's like these, a million dollars a month for three years. This is a forty million dollar pilot. This is a big yeah, deal. Yeah, it's a it's a big been, pilot. Yeah, been waiting for it for many many years. And the way the headlines came out was a little bit jarring because it seemed like a little bit of a unforced error. But yeah, one of the things I heard one people say in general is like, look, people worked less, and that's as simple as the uh, analysis was. But Scott, when you di- when you dive in deeper, what's really happening there? 
Yeah. So the the main thing here, the the headline finding was a two percent reduction of employment and hours worked on average, and that's where a lot of people go, "Oh my gosh!" Like, wait a second, people actually became um, like left their jobs and they they worked less. Uh, oh my gosh, that just means that this was a, a horrible failure, and it ignores like the that result is an average. And so, first of all, I point out that it's equivalent to a 15-minute break each workday or eight days of paid vacation a year. So from that context, and I include this in my my article here, um, from that context, eight days of paid vacation a year would still put us below every single country in the OECD, where the minimum is... 10 days of paid vacation in Japan. So this idea that, that somehow um, our country would like just our economy would evaporate or be destroyed by, um, by an average of people taking eight days of paid vacation a year is just nuts to me. Um, But I think more importantly is the information within the average and that information is that you didn't see any decreases in employment um, for childless uh, adults and adults between the ages of um, 30 and 40. Uh, and a- another note, this pilot only included people between the ages of 21 and 40. So um, it's not like, you know, it included people uh, 50 and 60 and whatever. This was between 21 and 40. And the um, decreases in, in work were only seen in those between 21 and 30. And, and mostly new parents, you said, right? Like people taking care of their kids. Yeah, single parents. It's a good reason to work a few less hours to do more good parenting. Yeah, and I included too in my in my article that this matches what we've seen uh in previous pilots too, like overall, uh, I, I share the conclusion of a peer, peer-reviewed 2020 study of 38 studies. And so this is, you know, this is what we've seen over and over and over again. And so, quote, uh, despite a detailed search, we have not found any evidence of a significant reduction in labor supply. Instead, we found evidence that labor supply increases globally among adults, men and women, young and old, in the existence of some insignificant and functional reductions to the system, such as decrease in workers from the following categories. Children, the elderly, the sick, those with disabilities, women with young children to look after, or young people who continued studying. These reductions do not reduce the overall supply, since it is largely offset by increased supply from other members of the community. So, this is just a really important finding that I like to highlight a lot because it really is just the general theme we see from basic income pilots. So when you see in a pilot like this that single parents worked a little bit less and also young people worked a little bit less, and you also see that um, a lot of them actually started up, you know, schooling, uh, upskilling, that kind of thing, then, you know, is it Again, is it accurate to even think of this as like a decrease in work if you're shifting to forms of unpaid work like care work and schooling? Right. We should we should change the maybe there's a cultural shift we need to do to start using job as a verb instead of work, because going to school and studying is work. It's a it's a very valuable form of work that pays dividends for the person and society later. But we can we confuse jobs and work where jobs is just a little part of work uh and that's where some of the nuance is lost in these studies that are like oh people work less for it just raises a lot of questions for me like uh are people going from eight hours to six hours or from 58 hours to 56 hours uh from running a a much more intimate little pilot for our docuseries what i saw one example of a story is a woman with cystic fibrosis who most people in her condition aren't working any jobs. She was working three jobs, and she dropped to two. Uh, And so she's still basically working full-time, teaching kids dance and stuff like that, but she's not running herself absolutely ragged. 
these are the reasons that more work does not more jobbing does not always equal good it equals like more jobbing that's what it is sometimes less jobbing like in these in this pilot where the people who worked less still experienced more economic security and still worked uh and still worked at home uh, and still did other things outside of their jobs is a very positive outcome that the headlines spin it very negatively and very simplistically. But these people all be became better and more empowered in their lives and were able to add more to society than they were before. But if you're looking at it from like a skeptic's point of view, where you're basically already made up your mind that, uh, giving people money is going to make them lazy. You look at this headline and you say, look, they work less. I was right. You know? So it's, that's the problem. Like it's, it's that surface level analysis, like that really you can kind of look at it either way, really. Like, even though, you know, I, I'm with you, I totally disagree that that's a good way to, to see that number and to think about work. People do think about work that way. They think about work as proof of being non-lazy, right? So, like, uh, your subject who did, uh, subject, your friend who um, went from three jobs to two jobs, uh, you know, that she just got lazier, right? Yeah. Like, that's what <laughs> happened. She and if gave you, her money. She got lazy. And if you know and her, like, it's you can like look at it that way. The most <laughs> it's, ridiculous it's sucky, thing ever, which is why it's like there's there's different ways to present information. And essentially mm -hmm. by just coming out right off the bat with a part of the information and the data that's going to come out of this study and burying the lead, all the different types of leads in favor of people work less, like the the organization doing mm -hmm. the research themselves like put that right up at the top as like this is our big finding it's it's very confusing to me that they 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 would just sort of like do a gotcha on on their own mm -hmm. study you know but so it kind of shows to me that like data isn't going to be the thing that's going to cause a cultural shift right like there's oh sure and people just latch yeah. on to whatever data that they like you know cherry picking right, yeah. as far as you know if you're <laughs> against this and you just find one thing and you're like oh there you go and it's like mm -hmm. well what about this hundreds of other things to look at and they're like i don't care about that mm -hmm. you know like right. you can you can just say those are those are bad pilots those are bad studies mm -hmm. whatever uh, suits my this narrative one, this is like the true story like that kind of thing mm -hmm. it's not it's not even but, uh, picking picking and choosing data it's like the data you choose like looking at it through a very limited lens like not actually mm -hmm. understanding that that very specific chosen data uh in, oh, in, yeah. and of, in and of itself you know not even reading the study you just find like an op-ed that's about it and that's distortive and full of mis misinformation and you're like no that's that study you know that yeah. agrees with me instead of like actually reading the study and getting into the nuances of this so like, a, like another example now. of this is, yeah. is like i like that like in this format with when we can show pictures and video and stuff um, you, know, you can look at a graph like this, and this is you know, from the report, and you can see that this started off in 2020, um, you know, right about 2021. And so this is deep in the pandemic, and there was a lot of unemployment, and that's when the money started going out. So both of these groups um, grew. And if you, you know, look too, and this is you know, a matter of... Um, you know, you're, you've got two different groups and you, you try f try to make them as similar as possible. You've randomized this, but there's always going to be a slight difference. And um, it started out that the, uh, that the control group was, as you can see, just a little bit more employed than the uh, basic income group. And then by the end, there's still just a little bit more than the basic income group. But then the, the finding is, oh, the, even though the basic income group grew in employment quite a bit just like the control group the control group just finished up a little bit uh, more employed than the recipient group yeah. and so you know you've got to you got to take that into account as well where it's it's insane to to look at this chart and say that basic income made people lazy because clearly <laughs> you had all these people getting jobs um, who were unemployed when this started and right. yet they're, work, they're working more than they were the other yeah. thing uh, that I noticed that isn't in any of these headlines is um, 
this was a pilot where the main purpose I think had to do with uh, children and child development and household dynamics and things like that, where that's the data they haven't actually started looking at and preparing. They decided to start with the, like the labor and employment data. So this is like a, a first wave of information from this pilot that wasn't even part of their main focus when they designed and conceived of the thing. So we, we still have a lot more to see about how it impacted quality of life and household dynamics and, um, you know, the health of and, and well-being of children. Yeah. Here's another quote to, from the, uh, from the study to show also this to how ridiculous it is to say that, you know, they were like lazy or something. And so, uh um, you know, recipients were significantly significantly more likely, 3.3 percentage points, to have pursued education or job trading during the final year of the program, an increase of 14% relative to the average control participant. The effect was greatest for recipients who had the lowest household income at enrollment. These individuals were on average 34% more likely to have participated in education or job trading during the third year of the program compared to control participants. So yeah, what that means is this uh, the the cohorts were subdivided by income into those who were earning under a hundred percent of the poverty line, and then those who were between one hundred and two percent, two hundred percent, and then those who were between two hundred percent and three hundred percent, and then so then that was as as high as it went. You didn't get you weren't part of this pilot if you were earning over three hundred percent of the federal poverty line. So I just think it was really interesting that those who actually work the most out of this um, were those with the lowest incomes. It was those between 200% and 300% of the poverty line where you saw the largest impact on work reductions, meaning that it's somehow, you know, if you're going to say that made people lazy, it's making like the middle class lazy. Uh, it's not making the poor lazy. And yet what all of our traditional, um, you know, debate is and you know, this beliefs and this myth is that it's the poor who are lazy and that's why they're poor. And it's also like as you get higher and higher in terms of personal comfort, the more you can start making decisions like are these like three times the poverty line or closer to the middle class people getting lazier or are they starting to be able to pursue a little bit more other types of purpose and work? You know, is it like, okay, now I can, I can, I can work 40 hours instead of 50 hours at my job so I can volunteer and I can volunteer at the school, which doesn't pay, but is, makes me feel like I'm, you know, a more fulfilled person. Yeah. And not only that kind of, uh, that kind of work, but also creating your own work, creating your own jobs. And that's another thing where you can read an article about this and it'll say that there was no, um, you know, uh, perceived increase in entrepreneurship and they'll just stop there um but then if you look into this and actually read the study you'll see that that's another one of those things where on average there wasn't this this large impact but there was a large impact actually on black recipients and women so here uh, black recipients were nine percentage points more likely to report ever starting or helping start a business and that was a 26% increase from the average for black control participants. And also uh, female participants were five percentage points more likely to report ever starting or helping to start a business. And that was a 15% increase from the average female control participant. Um, that's again, something that we see uh, elsewhere where the entrepreneurship impact is can be very large for uh, people where like, there's kind of capital scarcity. That's why you see like huge uh, entrepreneurship impacts in places like India and Namibia, where you're looking at like, you know, tripling the number uh, compared to the control group. So those are, you know, huge increases because um, like money is scarce. But uh, here, um, you know, if you're, let's say a white male um, like us, then it's actually much easier to get capital, to get credit uh, in order to start a business. But if you're black or if you're a woman, then it's more difficult um, to do that. So that way, this basic income actually helps those groups quite a bit. 
That's actually one of the things I, I learned pretty starkly, like living in a bunch of different types of neighborhoods in New York City and then starting up these businesses, the documentary and the and the platform, it, I had to take on a lot of risk. Uh, and, you know, at, at certain points, it looked like balance transfers on our credit cards so that we could just float for a while. And one thing I hadn't appreciated coming from uh, more of a middle class privileged family um, and being an engineer and having like all these credit cards and being annoyed by you know credit card offers and things like that um, was in these I remember the moment like I was at a bodega in some like less well off neighborhood in New York City I was start struggling artist or whatever but I bought a pack of Reese's or something and I gave them a credit card and they said debit right and this had happened a lot of times like every single time debit right and I would say no it's credit um, and, uh, it dawned on me, oh, they don't have the situation of being annoyed by credit card offers. There's a lot of people here that can't get a credit card, which is basically society saying, we don't trust you enough to, t to invest in yourself. We're not going to give you that line of credit. So if, if I hadn't had a credit card, couldn't, we couldn't have started all the, the projects we started. We basically just couldn't have got off the ground. Uh, and that's a world of difference for people. This next section is is um, you know about job searching, but what you just said you know ties into this uh, as well. Where part of the context of this experiment too um, was that you know this wasn't universal. There was no universality to this. If you're if you're someone living and you're in like a small town, and let's say there's uh you know a few thousand people living there and like you and one other household uh is in this pilot then there's not going to be more new jobs available for you to accept um it's when money is universal that creates customers and then customers spend their money and then that spending of the money creates demand for employers to hire more workers that's where these new jobs come from so uh again one of the one of the interesting findings in this pilot too was this job search evidence uh where recipients were five percentage points more likely to indicate that interesting or meaningful work was an essential condition for any job they would accept, and recipients were also six percentage points more likely to be actively searching for a job and four point five percentage points more likely to have applied for a job so Again, how can you say that the basic income made people lazy when they were more likely to be searching for a job and more likely to be applying for jobs? This just shows that what they were doing was being choosier about their jobs, and maybe they weren't able to find this like better job. You know, they they didn't accept the first job because they had hoped that they could find a better job. But then because these pilots weren't universal, there wasn't, you know, a saturation site, then there weren't new jobs created for them to accept. So in some of the times, you know, some of these people moved to find like a better job, uh, but some people, you know, didn't. And they just hoped to find a job uh, within their existing area and maybe weren't able to do that. And that doesn't mean that they were lazy. It was just them holding out looking for a better job which is good like we want better skills matching we want people to find jobs that are best for them and not just finding the very first job that's something we saw in 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 real time too with our with our pilot is people um taking a taking a second uh a second longer because they weren't desperate to get a new job and we had people moving out of sort of dead end jobs taking even another week to hold out for something more fulfilling and going from a cycle of dead end jobs to by the end of our two year pilot, like leveling up and starting a career and, and being ad like flexible and adaptive on the, on the upward trajectory of that career. And of course, depending on how you look at data, they could be just as employed. Uh, if someone said, Oh, they had a job and now they have a job and they worked 40 hours. Now they work 40 hours. Now they're making three times as much as something that they don't hate um, because they had the ability to wait a little bit. And some people have to wait a little bit longer. But if you have to, if you're desperate enough that you have to take the first job that offers, that really limits your ability, you know, to 
to direct your career path and your life path. One of my favorite things about this pilot too was, you know, this wasn't only about um, the quantitative data. This actually, they made a point of, of doing some good qualitative data work and getting stories and uh, because we know that stories can help frame what this data is telling us. One of the stories that I that I wanted to make sure and include um, in my piece and also uplift here is the story of, of Lisa. So it says, uh, now, Lisa is a single mother to three living in Texas. At the start of the program, she had no income. Lisa has lupus, which kept her out of the workforce at the time, and her short-term disability had been cut off. At the time, her goal was to return to the workforce. Because of the $1,000 per month, Lisa is able to take a job making less money than at her previous job, but with a company that offered more opportunity for growth. Two years later, Lisa is in a salaried position, making over $75,000 a year, has gotten two promotions, and thinks she can get another within a year. She loves her job. Lisa was also able to leave her abusive boyfriend and move into her own place, which wouldn't be possible without the unconditional cash transfers. Her three sons are thriving. And I, I really like this story for a couple of reasons where, you know, not only does it show that, like, it enabled her to afford to take a job that paid less, knowing that that job would be better in the long run. Like, so many people are stuck in jobs that, let's say, they're paying $20,000 a year, $30,000 a year or something. Um, and they cannot possibly afford uh, trying to find that other job where, you know, they'll have to take a day off work or something to go to some, um, to, to apply for a job or go to an interview or whatever. And, you know, the, to be able to afford to actually take this other job that pays less even, and then go on like that kind of long-term stuff, uh, is so important to realize. And then I also really love this, the fact that she left her abusive boyfriend because I read that story in the the data, the the qualitative story data, like over and over again. There's just multiple examples of women leaving abusive situations. Um, and you, you, you don't really see that. You know, it's not like it, when you see, oh, people work 2% less. Like you're, you're not seeing the fact that, you know, they left an abusive situation and, you know, maybe that was part of their story. Um, you have to look at this larger picture, but then since we're also talking about, um, geographic mobility too, and, in, in moving, then I'll also mention too, uh, here that there's another participant named Nikisha, uh, said that if she had had a job her life might be different, but she lives in a rural area and the jobs close by do not pay enough to offset the child's cost of childcare, and that better paying jobs are an hour and a half commute one way. So in the key to, in the Keisha's case, you know, she definitely, you know, she wants, she wants a job, she wants to work. Um, but childcare, the cost of that is a, is a massive obstacle. And that's also why when we did the expanded child tax credit, uh, that's one of the reasons why parents were able to, uh, especially like stay employed uh, through that. And then after the child tax credit ended, uh, parental employment went down because they were no longer able to afford childcare. So this again, like this is, this is a barrier that people have to a job. And it's not that they don't want one. It's that they can't afford to take that job. And also that working at home, taking care of your kids is work. Like, you know, that is a form of work that we shouldn't ignore. In terms of the moving and stuff, uh, recipients were on average 16% more likely to actively search for new housing and 23% more likely to actively search for a new neighborhood than the average control participant. They're yeah, also 4.4 percentage points more likely to move to new neighborhoods. So again, like if you want to move to a place because there's better jobs in that place, then basic income helps with that. And if you don't have that, a lot of people are just stuck where they are and just it, it's really difficult to find a job or a better job. It's largely about mobility in general. You, you can, because it follows you, and doesn't ask questions about where and why you're there. Uh, you can move move cities, states. You can 
you can move jobs, you can move partners, you can move houses. Uh, and there's not this whole process of things that are like punishing you for that. Like you lose something or it's just kind of how we're all shackled to our, our jobs because can't lose that healthcare benefit. If the, if it just follows you, that's not the reason you're working. And the, the big question of why anyone does anything is why are they doing that thing? You know, it's, if you're in a relationship because you need financial security rather than because of love, you know, or if you're at a job because you need health care rather than because it makes you feel like you're contributing something to the work and to the world, uh, then all of a sudden all of our engagement and everything is tainted by this like fear motivator or this avoidance of pain motivator. And, and we're not actually... Like this is why people aren't engaged in their jobs. This is why people aren't in healthy relationships. It's because they're not in it for the right reasons. So UBI allows people to pursue their their purpose in a way that means people will be in it for the right reasons far more of the time. It's uh, intrinsically motivated work. You're like being able to find what's best for you, what's uh, what you find valuable, is just so important. And it's 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 frustrating when you know people ignore that or even think it's good to essentially coerce people into stuff that they're not interested in at all um that's not good for productivity that's not good for general well-being um yeah we want people to to find the right things and you know that ties in too to i think the this next section as well which is drinking and drug use uh, considering that's such a huge thing that people worry about like oh we can't give people unconditional cash they're going to just waste it on drugs i was very pleasantly surprised by this like over and over again we know that is like this is a finding from uh, all over the world this is from just scores of unconditional cash pilots uh or programs that in general on net uh alcohol and drug abuse tends to go down. And so in, in this pilot, uh, for male recipients of basic income, there was a 41% decrease of being under the influence in dangerous situations, a 45% decrease in drinking interfering with responsibilities, a 35% decrease in drinking causing arguments with others, and a whopping 81% decrease in days using painkillers not prescribed to them. So this is for men. Again, if we if you look at men and women, then overall there wasn't as much of an impact. But this clearly had a very large impact, especially for men. And if you if we look at like the data that comes from um, you know the the deaths of despair situation going on, those deaths of despair are mostly impacting men. And so when you looking at uh, basic income as as being potentially a way of reducing those deaths of despair like whatever it is that's causing this and you know there's there's various uh, arguments as to you know why is it that men in particular are being impacted in this way that are driving them to you know greater opioid use and and greater alcohol usage if you if you uh are stressed out all the time if you're um if you can't find a job uh, that you are gaining some some meaning from, it's not meaningful in any way. Um, like these things lead to basically self medication behavior, and so that's what really bugs me when people complain about, oh, we can't do basic income because people would would drink and and do drugs more, and it's like, no, the entire reason people, um, or entire reason a lot of a lot of the reason that a lot of people are using um, drinking and drugs is to self-medicate away the fact that they lack a basic income floor, you know, that they are stressed out and that they're unable to find that meaning, that pursuit, that job, that volunteering, whatever it is that they feel would actually, you know, give their lives purpose. Right. These are checking out behaviors. They're escapist behaviors. And you engage in ex escapist ways of coping when your life is something you want to escape. The less it's something you want to escape, the less you engage in those behaviors because you have something to check into rather than checking out. Um, there, there was another thing I wanted to bring up too that I've been sort of realizing lately too. We've been synthesizing a lot of the information from our pilot for the series. 
and starting to look at all these stories together. And our, ours, we, we were very con conscientiously trying to get a wide range of types of stories. So from homeless to solidly middle class and all age groups in different areas of the country, um, different demographics and stuff. And one of the things that strikes me as funny with all these cherry pickings of the data is that UBI is different for different people. Like what do you use it for? It's like the ultimate Swiss army knife because it's just cash and it's whatever you need. Like last on the last podcast we talked about, I didn't need food stamps, but I needed a mattress, right? But there's, there's other deeper level trends too, where it's like, if you do a cohort of like college age students or kids in their twenties, and then you do a cohort of people in their sixties, you'll find very different things. Like as people either try to start a career in a life versus try to like protect what they have or like get to retirement. And that was one of the things we were noticing just recently is our stories of young people in college, recently out of college, the, the UBI actually acted way more like a stimulus and people were starting businesses or adapting between jobs and things like that and, and really leveling up. And then uh, we had several stories that were like in fifties and sixties that were either digging out from many decades of like hardship and so trying to bolster their situation and get safe going into retirement or they were trying to, you know, get a little healthier or a little sustainable. Um, it acts more like a pension, right? It acts more like a social security. And so if you're looking at the young cohort and you're like, how much did they use this to like put into savings uh, as your main metric rather than how much did they, you know, take a risk on starting a business, going back to school, whatever, you're looking at a metric that's not going to work for that cohort. And if you're looking at the older people and like, they didn't start any businesses, it's like, well, <laughs> they're <laughs> trying to get to retirement. And, and so this this cherry picking of data from like individual cohorts rather than like a universalist perspective that's like who's using it for what um, will always lead to these limited and um, not nuanced conclusions. Yeah, you're definitely going to find something different in a pilot focused on only people ages 21 to 40 than you are to do like a fully universal pilot in like a saturation site where you just cover the entire town and it's got people from all ages. And yeah, for... There's definitely a, something that people overlook. And like that age difference is actually part of the, the health impacts um, too. If you read these articles, one of the things that they'll do too is they'll say, oh, well, you know, there was no impact on, on health. There was no statistically significant impact on health. And, um, you know, that's, it's interesting because sure, I would have uh, expected a little bit more um, of an impact on, on health. Um, but when you look at like the ages too, you find that, you know, that they, they did visit, um, dentists and doctors more for preventative treatment. And that's interesting because even though, um, that's like technically, you know, like more healthcare use, then that's also preventative use. So then down the road, you know, 10, 20 years or something, um, there's going to be a lot more savings. At the same time as this pilot came out, uh, the, the studies in this pilot came out, the study from a different pilot came out, and it also looked at healthcare. Just want to highlight that one, too, is that that actually found um, you know, these, these big impacts. And that was uh, uh, basic income recipients in Chelsea were a third less likely to need to visit the ER. The average age in Chelsea was 45. There, I think that in this... It was that was actually kind of more of a saturation too, because there was a, a whole lot of people in Chelsea um, got this, and um, you saw this just like a third less ER visits. That's huge. Um, and then just yeah. one other thing too, because it ties right into this. But there's a, another study that just came out recently. I just looked at Alaska. That it's like this pilot of that of nineteen to forty or whatever has an average age in the twenties. In the 20s is when you don't go to the doctor. You you get your cheapest possible medical insurance, if you even do that. And <laughs> I guess you kind of have yeah. to these days. And you just, you're young enough where things aren't going wrong yet. And so you, I didn't go to the doctor in my 20s, hardly ever, unless I hurt something in soccer or something like that. And now I'm getting into my 40s. It's like I have to have a, the ability to to, you know, 
go in for regular checkups because this is when our bodies start dying, you know? These are ER visits that it was measuring, though, which is kind of weird. Like, those yeah. usually don't go to the ER, like, just because you're not, you know, for preventative care or something like that. But you go so more if the older yeah. you get, you know? Like, we yeah. in the Dauphinin experiment, that was a saturation site, and that was uh, a pilot was for four years, and they saw a, re a reduction of hospitalization rates of 8.5%. So... um that's the kind of thing where you know we expect to see some impact on on ER uh, visits, and the fact that the uh, open research pilot you know didn't see that, uh, I think, can be explained by the fact that it wasn't a saturation site, and that it was between ages twenty one and forty, um, because of the Chelsea uh, study that did find a large decrease uh, of a third of hospitalization rates. And then also, um, here's the uh, Alaska paper. And so they found um, this was a, uh, a, a $2,000 boost, you know, in this, this uh, the dividend, which is a basic income, uh, fully universal in Alaska, uh, resulted in a uh, significant uh, increase in pre preventive health care of six percentage points and that was uh four percentage points larger than the rest of the country so they conclude that uh ubi ought to be thought about as a form of health policy as uh ubi is a potential to advance a wide range of health objectives related to preventive care like we it is a great thing to actually be able to enable more people to access preventive care thanks to having a space income because that will help in the long run um, save a lot more on the healthcare system. I don't want to get, I don't want to cover this, um, the Sam Altman pilot too much more. Yeah, people just, should, just, people should people, just read your article. Yeah, so, like what go, happened in Sam Altman's pilot. Go check read out the article. Or put it in the comments. Uh, what's next? Yeah, what's next? Okay, so since we just covered uh, a lot of evidence maybe what would be particularly interesting is to uh is to cover some nonsense <laughs> uh, i think that i think that could be fun so there was there was a video that i watched recently and uh shared with conrad and josh that i just think is kind of a good example uh of what kind of stuff there is out there and what they're saying and um i think it's a good opportunity to even like do a little little bit of like critical thinking uh discussion and you know just be aware of what's out there and what's being said and and um you know the the, the this came to my attention because uh like someone on twitter uh shared it and said something like you know that this is like a like an even-handed look or something at, at basic income or whatever. And, and I said, okay, I'll, I'll give this a try. And I watched it and it's like, what? <laughs> so um, yeah, let's just, we'll go through it and just like pause it here and there. Um, just chat about it a bit and we won't throw the whole video. Um, people can find this if they want to. Um, but uh, yeah, let's just start here and then it's go for about like, I think like five or seven minutes or something. So it was handed out, was thrown into the crypto market, around 58 million to be exact. It goes without saying this didn't really affect prices much, but boy, did it make for a good narrative. Anyway, because all this de facto UBI during the pandemic was paid for using printed money, and because most of it was spent on goods and services provided by big brands, it resulted in record levels of inflation and even more extreme wealth. Okay, so just there where he just says that, you know, the stimulus checks um, like caused a bunch of inflation, like record inflation, um, that itself is is incorrect. Um, and it's very frustrating to see that that was like the lesson that anyone took from the um, pandemic, but also like 
you know, this guy is wearing a shirt about Bitcoin. Um, you know, they, anyone who is really into Bitcoin, it, for the most part, I think is a lot disproportionately representative. There's people who want people to believe that inflation is a huge problem so that you'll buy Bitcoin. And um, this was a pandemic, you know, like that's what caused inflation. We had global supply chain issues and we had back to back oil shocks. And the Federal Reserve looked at, you know, what could you, um, like, how much did like the stimulus actually account for inflation? And um, I've seen two different papers for this um, at, at different times looking back. And um, the estimates are from like one points to three points max. Uh, of this is of the the nine points total. So that is what. Um, you know, the, the fact that we, that we did these stimulus, um, first of all, that's not a basic income because you, you can, you know, most of us, when we're talking about basic income, we're talking about, um, essentially income that is paired with taxes too, so that there's no like expansion of the money supply. You know, this is, you know, considered revenue neutral or deficit neutral, um, basic income. It's very different than a fully deficit financed basic income where there's zero taxes at all paired with the basic income. You know, that will always be more inflationary. And yet here in this pandemic, you know, we did this this twofer of um first of all, we spent, you know, trillions, like a I think it was six to eight trillion total in stimulus and uh eight hundred billion of that was actually stimulus checks and you know the rest of it was boosted unemployment uh the the ppp program um right you know, so like, only 10 percent actually was the stimulus which is the only thing that really kind of resembled a ubi and right. the unemployment resembled like welfare as we know it work disincentives and you know stimulus to businesses was flooding the market with money at, at the time of the pandemic and it gets conflated. And exactly. like he said, a de facto UBI in his very smart sounding British accent. And so you're supposed to just accept it. But it really is not. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll keep going. Not a good outcome. So what all this tells us then is that if UBI was ever to be introduced, it would need to be targeted at those who need it and done in a way that doesn't cause economic productivity to decline. The OK, so there <laughs> he says, if if we actually do need basic income, then it needs to be targeted. And of course, targeting isn't basic income, that's welfare. And welfare is the issue that we're looking to fix with basic income. <laughs> it's the targeting that is the problem. It's in, if, you, if you target people, then you create high marginal tax rates. Uh, they can be over 50% and beyond. So you know, if someone's getting $1,000 per month, and a job offer is for thousand dollars a month, and if they take that, they still end up with a thousand dollars per month. Then the problem is not that they were getting a thousand dollars per month to begin with; it's that you took it away from them when they got the job, because that means that they're working for free, or it can also it's the same thing as being taxed at one hundred percent. That is that is the problem, and so to to look at basic income and say, oh well, if we do it, it should be targeted then that's completely misunderstanding basic income and also the issues with the existing system. But it's also where most people are at. Like most people, like I was just on a call today where someone was like, uh, yeah, I, I believe in UBI, but if we target it and we, we make sure like people have financial literacy classes and they have to take and, and we make sure the right people who are going to use it well get it and they're totally missing the point. Yeah. The caveat is, that this assumes that UBI will be needed to adjust to the next industrial revolution. It may not be. History suggests that all that will happen is that another link will be added to the chain of labor. To recap, the first industrial revolution involved adding machines to the mix. The second industrial revolution added more advanced machines to the mix. The third industrial revolution added computers to the mix. And this means it's likely that the fourth industrial revolution will just add AI, robotics and gene editing to the mix in ways that we don't fully understand yet. It could be something as straightforward as humans leading teams of androids to do certain tasks 
or even supervising them while they work on autopilot. There's just one problem, though. Okay, so just with that stuff, um, a, it's kind of a, a common argument too. You'll see that oh, um, all of these previous work, these labor revolutions and stuff, the thanks to technology, um, you know, we're all still employed, and so there was no problem, and we'll just create more new jobs with AI and robots. And just as with previous stuff, we'll all be fine. And that's completely ignoring just what happened during each of these like major industrial revolutions where yes, people were displaced from their jobs and yes, that caused a lot of issues. And sure, maybe it took 10 or 20 years or something um, in order for people to, uh, be able to be educated and skilled and and get into these new jobs that were created. Um, let's not ignore all that stuff that happened during that time, just because we're looking back from this, this point in time. And that's that even in this optimistic scenario, a large percentage of the population could still be left jobless. This is because of an uncomfortable truth that almost nobody talks about. Not Everyone is smart, and the existing science suggests that intelligence is mostly genetic. Take a second to consider that the US military refuses to enlist anyone with an IQ lower than 85, as they can't find any task for them that doesn't require constant supervision. This suggests that people with an IQ of lower than 85 will have a hard time supervising androids and such. That is 15% of the population, by the way. Note that around 12.5% of the US population receives food subsidies. This is probably not a coincidence. Okay. We're making <laughs> some big leaps dick. here. We're taking a <laughs> like, lot of little jumps here. <laughs> I, I think like, he probably considers himself to be one of the intelligent few who can handle the jobs that he imagines in the future of, I guess, supervising Robots I mean, but look at the like... the title is about it's taken down the elites, right? Why the elites want UBI? Like, as somebody that's sitting there putting down the IQ of people that can't get a job, <laughs> doesn't that kind of make you an elite now? <laughs> like, I mean, I, wh where are we going? Right, here? right. That's I'm, a very elitist viewpoint. I'm, yeah, I'm worried <laughs> right. about this guy. What's his job going to be right. when an AI can do a podcast better than him? <laughs> I, I think he might be AI. There's, there's a good chance he is. <laughs> He's kind of, yeah. It's a lot so of the, the pre-programmed responses are coming out here. Yeah. Like th this was um, this take is it's a it's a new twist on you know that we've it, it's it's common um, I guess it's it's common to believe that one of the reasons we won't have to worry about. Um, the automation of jobs is because we'll create new jobs where people work with AI and robots and they'll just need to reskill and then it'll, it'll be fine. But then this kind of twist on it is saying that there's actually a good percentage of people, um, he says around 15%, who are completely incapable of ever being smart enough to learn how to work with AI or robots. In which case, you know, they're like the the useless eaters. And um, then he mentions to this this correlation, um, you know, was saying that, oh, this is a very similar percentage to those who are on on food stamps in the US. So clearly, you know, he wants it just like a wink wink saying that everyone who is receiving food assistance uh, is there not because their incomes are low and not because like all the reasons why income could be low, but it's because they're stupid. Like they are, they are genetically stupid according to him. And so therefore, um, you know, that's like just, it's disgusting fully, to actually it, say I mean, something it, like it, that. It is to fully buy into this idea of a meritocracy that everyone landed where they did because we have a system that, you know, rewards people appropriately to their abilities and their talents and their efforts, um, which is a is a very comfortable position to have if you find yourself in 
in a very comfortable position because then it says, I earned this. I deserve it. I deserve to be, you know, a podcaster with 2.51 million subscribers because <laughs> I'm like 2.51 million times more intelligent than yeah. that person on food stamps. And it's, uh, it's so absurd. I don't think he realizes all the ways in which he could be on welfare if some element of his life was different. Um, and yeah, it kind of hurts for people to like think of themselves as different creatures than other human beings. Yeah. Well, if he's heavily invested in, in, in Bitcoin and, and crypto and stuff too, it's always possible that something could happen to that entire sector. And maybe that would mean that a lot of his money and wealth is completely wiped out and maybe he needs some help. And how fitting would that be for someone to then look at him and go, well, you were stupid enough to invest in Bitcoin and crypto, <laughs> like you're an idiot. And so therefore you don't deserve assistance for eating. Like how fitting would that be? Right. But this doesn't, this isn't, this isn't even the craziest is, is about this video too. So we'll keep going and we're oh, going to keep strong. It, it's, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it gets even weirder. In terms of raw numbers, that's tens of millions of people who will struggle to find work as jobs become more complex. Believe it or not, though, the bigger problem is that the population is declining. Besides the fact that fewer people means less production and consumption, fewer people also means fewer smart people overall. This means fewer people who can work the next generation of jobs. As entertaining and terrifying as it is to think about robots replacing humans, it probably won't happen in our lifetime. This means that the fourth industrial revolution may simultaneously result in millions of people losing their jobs and there being millions of open positions that few people have the cognitive capacity to fill. The silver lining is that advancements in gene editing could make it possible to increase intelligence. But this would simultaneously open the Pandora's box of genetic engineering, a box that many would argue has already been opened. In case you missed the news, Back in 2019, a Chinese scientist was arrested for trying to edit the genes of babies so that they would be resistant to illnesses like HIV. It's not far-fetched to assert that similar levels of genetic editing are already taking place in secret labs around the world. <laughs> right. So it's not far-fetched to assert that in secret labs taking place all over the world, there is secret gene editing going on, creating super intelligent human beings. And it is these super intelligent human beings that thankfully will be able to work because they're smart enough with AI and robots. And so therefore, that won't be a problem. Now, should they feed wait. us, our, us normies? <laughs> like, should these super intelligent beings feed us or... Should we? We will be expire? the food. We're going to uh, be the food. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so make sure that you're nice and plump and healthy because you'll soon it. be devoured. I just, I, I, I love this kind of stuff. How, and I do not understand. I do not understand how people can like watch something like this and just like nod their heads along and just be like, oh yeah, that's not far fetched. Like, of course. There's that, that makes all the sense in the world that there's these secret labs where super smart humans are being genetically engineered. Like, well, yeah, sure. He says, there, he says all the things very with such alluring confidence. about. Yeah, it's a, there's something that's like, oh, well, of course, yeah, yeah, right. I, I'm with you, and, and it, I, it's it's such an easy little trick to pull that like. Uh, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm following. And even though like the things I'm following aren't really don't link up even at all. <laughs> like, I'm like, and yeah, the part, I got gotcha. you. The part where he slides in gene editing uh, as like, this is in the same discussion, right. you know, it's like, he's like bringing in his like personal pet passions and when the nanotechnology and like, these will come together to make my fever dream a reality. And it's like, uh, you're just, just so emboldened by something like he's very very confident um in his takes and i i want to i want to maybe a little bit of like whatever he's eating that makes him feel so confident in himself because i always come at it everything with like i don't know until i really know i always like lead with 
actually more yeah. trepidation to like speak so confidently. I only speak confidently about UBI because I've been like studying it in every different way for eight years. But, yeah, and what I don't get, I, I do not assume that he even believes this stuff. And that's the that's the thing. Like, I don't know if he's acting confident to sell what he's saying or if he himself believes what he's saying and is selling what he's saying. Like, either way, it's messed up. But, you know, one is is completely lying to people about this. And the other is just having duped himself. Many have claimed that there are human clones walking among us already. It would be crazy if <laughs> Many the fourth industrial <laughs> revolution ended up being driven by genetics instead of AI and robots. And yet it would somehow be exponentially saner than the idea that some AI-enabled robots are going to take all our jobs. Not only that, but it would probably be exponentially cheaper and easier to genetically modify current and future humans than create an army of advanced AI robots from scratch. As a cherry on top, there would also be no need for UBI because everyone would be able to work any job. The problem, though, is that this would also be exponentially more terrifying as the long-term consequences of this genetic engineering are completely unknown. Never okay. Okay. Like, this is, this is the mm. first time that I've ever seen this argument that that we won't need UBI because we will all be genetically engineered to be smart enough to have jobs. And that like the bad scenario is for like a bunch of robots to do our work for us. And the good scenario is that we all have jobs doing what robots could do for us, but, but we are smart enough to actually do ourselves. Right. So now I'm going to be uh, basically Captain America with, a hyper intelligence and because of those abilities i'll be able to keep my job as a dishwasher you're gonna be able to work five jobs <laughs> at once <laughs> yeah. no one's be gonna like wash dishes better than me. <laughs> it's 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 funny you like, have he, like 25 tabs going on your chrome right now <laughs> each one he, doing a different job making money yeah, 25 so different <laughs> ways damn productive it's mm -hmm. it's funny he, he only seems to be able to really imagine in his like future techno futurist uh vision is like i think it feels like all of the robots are humanoids right they're they're like all walking around <laughs> like us <laughs> right yeah they're like versions of us that are like smarter mm -hmm. somehow and that's the extent of what he imagines robots to be uh and it's like uh, you should watch the movie her like that that to me is a really great both terrifying and nuanced and deep portrayal of like what does it really look like when something gets infinitely smarter than us and doesn't like why would it need to walk around like with arms and legs um <laughs> specifically the way we do competing for our dishwasher job it's it's so but, like juvenile it's like a it's like a child's yeah. understanding of robots it, it may and be like that the, those were the only stock photos available so give me a break here <laughs> the 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 flip side to this too that that bothers me is the, if if it's true that we won't have to worry about, you know, unemployment or something in the future because we're all smart enough to have jobs. You know, all of that being just ridiculous on its own. It's also from that means that right now, if you're unemployed, it's because you're too dumb to have a job. And of course, that's not how it works. Like you can be unemployed for all kinds of reasons. And there's constantly people who are unemployed and you, you shift from one job to the next. Many people are temporarily unemployed. And base income would actually work better than like this unemployment system. Like again, we're this is like the confusion between base income and the pandemic unemployment assistance program. Like during the pandemic unemployment assistance, two thirds of people who were receiving money from that um, were getting more than that they were earning prior to that with their jobs. So. They were they lost their jobs and got a boost in income, and then if they were re were to return to that job, then they would actually cut their pay. So why would you do that? And so if you understand basic income as being this floor, then you understand that it already makes more sense than unemployment too, and that it enables you to find jobs and enables you to create jobs, enables you to move to jobs, it enables people to spend money that creates jobs. Like just this assumption that unemployment is only a problem because people are too stupid 
it is it's infuriating. Well, it's also just totally yeah, it's misunderstanding the mechanism and the the math of it. The reason why someone under a punitive welfare system and like something that gets taken away uh, would not go get a job is not out of laziness or stupidity. It's actually the wise financial decision. Like you will actively hurt your family by taking a job. Uh, and the the system we've set up is saying like, if you go get that job, now you're risking your safety and you're going to make less money. Uh, it's actually the smartest financial move you can make. And, and so like the way the welfare cliff system is set up, I wonder if he's aware at all. Like there are in the U.S. system, for example, between earning uh, something like thirty thousand and sixty thousand dollars a year, if you're on some level of benefits, it does not make mathematical sense to earn more income. Like if you go in and work an extra hour, you actually walk with less income and benefits. So you'd be you'd be arguably dumber to to do that to to take more work, and that's why people are pissed off when they get a raise sometimes. Um, and then on the flip side of that, I met, I interviewed someone once who said they did just that. They worked an extra hour. They lost, you know, 50 bucks in their benefits that week. And I asked, why did they go? And they said, well, I'm a, I'm a home health aide and my clients need me. Uh, so it was that, that woman's integrity that she was actually paying to go help people. We put her in that situation where she had to hurt herself to contribute to society. And she did it anyway. So these are the people that this guy would say, are lacking character, lacking intelligence. And it just, it makes me sick. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's next go to, um, this is a video that I actually haven't watched yet. And neither, um, no, no one here has, has watched this video yet. Uh, but it's a short video. It's seven minutes, 50 seconds. And it's from the Denver basic income project. And I, I thought this would be good to watch after that previous one together, just because this will actually speak to people who received basic income themselves that have actually experienced, you know, life without a basic income, life with basic income. And, um, but are there I any clones in it or any of these people genetically <laughs> modified at all? Because that's, that's all I care about. I mean, how are okay. we yeah. now? That's right. <laughs> okay. All right. For me, that's what Denver Basic Income Project has done. They cared enough to show support. I'm not looking for a handout. I'm looking for a hand up. Denver Basic Income Project rescued me off the cliff. I will use my voice every opportunity I get. The Denver Basic Income Project is an experiment project that's testing delivering guaranteed income to people experiencing homelessness in Denver. We're the first and largest project of its kind to study the impact of GI on homelessness specifically. And the idea is that giving people direct cash, no strings attached, would allow them to meet their most basic immediate needs on their own. We think of it as sort of preventative medicine for the economy. That's what guaranteed income is. When you address something up front, it costs a fraction of what it costs to deal. I just want to pause it quick here just to mention that, you know, this is Mark Donovan. And we've actually, uh, the three of us here have spoken with Mark before. Uh, he was the one of our guests on uh, It's Alive over when we were doing Spaces on Twitter. So um, if anyone actually wants to listen to what our discussion was with Mark, then um, that's a, you can do that. And it was like a whole, like an hour long discussion. It was great. Yeah, we've, we've got a whole history of well, a couple dozen of these long conversations and, and half of them are with um, really awesome people doing work in the space or in the tangential space. Uh, uh, if you go to the YouTube co-mingle channel, yeah. kind of browse through those by subject or whatever. It's, it's pretty fun deal with the downstream consequences of not dealing with it. And right now we were experiencing that with healthcare costs, with, um, with the cost of the criminal justice system, with mental health and substance issues. And these are all complex and interrelated. But the beauty of guaranteed income is that it's simple, it's cost effective, it's quick, 
and it really can work across all of those societal problems in one fell swoop. Council was very supportive. They understand this as a tool in our uh, tool belt to be able to get folks the resources that they need um, and understanding that there are different pathways uh, to be able to address some of the big issues that are happening with our community when it comes to transportation, when it comes to housing, um, when it even comes to medical care, um, that we have a responsibility uh, and an opportunity. And I think they saw basic income as an opportunity for us to really pull out our tools to be able to help um, enrich the lives of Denverites. We launched um, the hard launch of the pilot um, back in November of 2022, and the total cohort was 807 folks um, receiving cash, so over 800 individuals and families. Group A receives $1,000 a month for 12 months. Group B receives $6,500 up front that first month, and then for the next 11 months receives $500 a month. And then our active comparison group, Group C, receives $50 a month. Some of the results we've seen were really promising housing outcomes. Um, on average, 45% of all participants ended up being in a house or apartment that they rent or own at the 10-month mark. The number of folks who reported being stably housed doubled in 10 months. So that's just one way that illuminates how these payments have allowed folks to go from um, experiencing homelessness in one way or another to finding their way into a home or apartment or into whatever stable housing looks like for them. We're seeing rises in full-time employment for groups A and B. We're seeing a decrease in food insecurity. We're seeing a decrease um, specifically in, in stress and anxiety amongst parents. So overall, we're trying to look at our data as both a quantitative and a qualitative picture and kind of seeing how both of those reports we have both on our website um, blend together to tell a larger story. And based off the data that we collected from our participants over time and the reduction of services that they used, they estimated that on average, DBIP participants um, saved almost $600,000 in public spending. did give everybody um, a cell phone as well with free service and data so that they could stay connected with us. And then people who were not banked, um, they had an opportunity to take the card that we gave them so that they had access to the money. A lot of the programs that are out there, there's a lot of difficulty in getting access into those programs. When you are doing a program like the Denver Basic Income Project and providing direct cash, um, there's not a lot of that um, red tape that you have to go through. It's really simple. Fundamental to this was starting from a place of trust and saying, we believe in you, we trust you, we're going to give this to you unconditionally. All of a sudden, there's a sense of hope. There's a sense that maybe my future could be better. The Denver Basic Income Project is family. They actually care about the individual. They want, they want you to do good. At the time that I got involved with the Denver Basic Income Project, I had just gotten evicted from my house. I was involved in an on-the-job uh, car accident where I was hit from behind by an 18-wheeler, which started all this in, into motion. Receiving $1,000 a month for me truly, truly was life-altering because I had already made it up in my mind that I was too far behind and I could not see. I couldn't see the tunnel, much less light on the other side. And I had already decided that if, if this program did not work, if I was not accepted, then that weekend, I was gonna drive up to the mountains, find me a nice icy road and end it. So, uh, and I do get emotional. <clears throat> and so for me, when they told me that I would receive a thousand dollars a month to a lot of people, and especially if you live in Colorado, a thousand dollars doesn't sound like a lot, but for me, it made my car payment. It made my insurance payment. So I was actually able to have some place where I knew I could sleep. 
someplace secure. Our top priority is always our. Okay. It's like that part I just feel is super powerful. Like it just immediately makes me think of the previous video too, where, you know, is this guy, is, is, does he have an IQ of 85 or under? Is he like too stupid to have a job? Like, no, uh, he was in an accident. Well, stuff happens in life and it happened to him. Um, that is what led to his homelessness. And then this, this basic compile it happens right at the time when he's thinking, you know, what's the point of, of going forward anymore? He's thinking of ending his life and basic income uh, is there to like save him. And that basic income actually enables him to feel secure in that even though, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't have a home and doesn't like have this nice house or whatever that people feel that, you know, is, is the end all be all, you know, and he, he's actually able to have like a home in that, for a place for him to call home that gives him that security. He's not going to be living on the streets and he's able to, you know, afford gasoline. He's able to afford his car and that's, you're able to uh, afford employment. Um, yeah. It's just, yeah, it's nuts to me that, that it, this is the reality of, of basic income right it's here. It's not even to me that it saved him. It's that it gave him enough power and enough leverage to save himself right yeah. and it it ubi isn't about any of this intellectual bullshit it's not about jobs it's not about ai i mean there's these these are all like reasons and ways in to care about it like ai means we're going to need something uh because our labor market won't work and jobs are an important right. source of dignity and work and and purpose for a lot of people and these are all true things but these are all secondary to what UBI is really about. And UBI is about, it's about people. And like watching these two videos back to back, is pretty stark for me. Like this, this guy, he's got his head in whatever space clouds, like thinking about, uh, you know, robots and gene editing and like bullshit. He's not connected to the reality of people. And you spend, and this, like this, these kinds of stories are, are what I've been immersed in, in the last eight years. And it changes you. Like you, when you actually get to learn what makes people function, you don't find yourself anymore making broad proclamations about the economics of intelligence and and and, <laughs> yeah. and like everyone's like a a node on a table or something. Like people have real stories, and what actually drives them is not what actually drives people is wanting is wanting to matter, wanting to bring purpose to their lives into the world and that that's the long and short of it that's where ec economists get it wrong that's where futurists get it wrong when they want to imagine people as like numbers on a spreadsheet uh they're really they're really not yeah it, it's just it's it's so human that's why i think you know bootstraps is such a powerful project that i mean telling these telling these real stories it's always the most powerful thing and it's um, I would. I was hoping that there'd be more stories than just his in this little seven-minute video. Maybe there's someone else left here before the end of it, but um, that's just where that's where yeah. the other understanding of basic comes from. It's sort of poignant too, because the Denver Basic Income Project has run into some of the similar hurdles of the Sam Altman project that we were talking about earlier, where it's like some of the data and the analysis and the media spin and stuff is getting railroaded by very specific lanes of study based on very specific metrics that are missing the point in a lot of cases. So the one is the fact that this was a very targeted cohort and it was just for a very specific set of uh, people who were starting homelessness in, in a certain area. And it, it, totally, it, it totally misses the breadth of how UBI works. And it, I think in some ways, you know, if you're going to do a, a pilot on homelessness, the the data that you're collecting for how they're going to use it, people who are already in homelessness rather than about to fall into it, or or in a million other situations, there's a very specific data set you should be interested in as to how do they. It's basically my question is how do they use their UBI? Not did they work this many more hours a week or whatever it is. It's right. it's got to be more of a question 
that you look for an answer rather than leading with a, a, a metric that you have decided, you know, externally is important to you and putting it on this group. Yeah. And not only um, how does, how does, how does someone use it, but um, like, how does it, how does it impact their behavior where even if it's not about like some kind of income boost, you know, like if you just feel more secure that you're going to be okay. Uh, you don't even have to, you can just like save it up. Uh, it doesn't have to like buy anything during the time that you have it, but knowing it's there can make such a huge difference. Okay, let's uh, finish this up. And so being there for them, listening to them, understanding their needs, we, we need more funding to continue or to run this first cohort longitudinally. We need additional funding to set up a, a, a second cohort and to start to, to expand. We want to show that this is replicable. When people ask, what can I do? If, if you're just kind to somebody on the street, that can make a difference. Do what you can today in your own way to take whatever we, we've shown is possible with this and expand it. Of course, donating to our project is a, a, me, a way to have immediate impact. We can bring this to policy at the national level. Um, so we have this opportunity here in Denver to accelerate and to help more people move from homelessness to thriving. Stay elevated, Lisa. All right. Yeah, so some news uh, tied to this, actually, um, even though this just came out a week ago, uh, but I, you know, I'm sure they filmed it earlier, so it doesn't like have the newest stuff. Something recent is um, they, they just sent out their most recent check uh, to Back on. people in the current cohorts. But, yeah. And, um, you know, there, there was just a, a march, you know, um, on um, to the mayor's office um, where they were pushing for um, the more funding for this to keep it going. And they were pushing for uh, $5 million to continue this um, for another year. Uh, and also they were hoping for $10 million to do like another um, different like cohort. Um, and like, they want this to keep going, but then the mayor responded uh, that they felt that the data from the first year wasn't good enough, so that they're you know they're not recommending doing this this funding again for more. So because of that, um, just want to quickly go through um, just like what that evidence was from this this pilot and so this is a from a this is a thread of mine on twitter uh about this stuff uh in response to noah smith who um you know said that it's really disappointing results and you know there's been a lot of coverage about that saying it's disappointing but um you know it it, it wasn't yeah i i don't look at this as as disappointing especially you know if you're looking at you know the story we just saw clearly it it did good for somebody um but there's a you know a couple things about this so first of all um you know if you look at the the groups based on those who were unsheltered at the beginning um at least when the money first started going out then the $1000 per month 43% of those who were unsheltered at the beginning of the pilot, uh, found housing. And that was compared to uh, 26% in Group C and 25 in Group B. Um, so, you know, some people are, are, are saying like, oh, it's amazing how this $50 a month group did. Um, and so clearly like $1,000 per month doesn't really do much. Um, but that's that's uh, that's a big difference uh for you know reducing homelessness and yeah when it comes to the fifty dollars per month too uh it's 
you know, it, it, it's it's an interesting control group, and again, it's it, there's nuance in these in these studies, and it's and it's tough to um, really explain those and and dig into this, and you know, even write about it um, in like a quick blog post or whatever, some news piece um, to really get into those nuances. But um, like this this group C who got fifty dollars per month, that wasn't the only thing that they got. You know, first of all, they went into this pilot. Um, and they they're, they referred through uh, like a sister organization, and so then they were they were already like basically in the pipelines um, to get assistance. So these are like people who are homeless who are who are looking for help, and then they're they're part of this this organization that's helping them, and then this this organization is able to further help them through this pilot, and they all got um, phones with phone plans too. And so now they're they're connected to this organization. They're connected to others. You're more able to get a job, even just from having a cell phone, things like this. And so, yeah, it can it can make quite a quite a big difference. And you're also these organizations are connecting you to other programs too. So you know you can you can get SNAP, you can get uh, housing vouchers, and um, SSI and these things. Whereas if you uh, start getting a thousand dollars per month, then that will impact those things. So you're not even looking at two equal groups. You know, you're looking at like fifty dollars per month plus welfare, and a thousand dollars per month. You know, with less welfare, and so then that's like an important kind of um, point too. And um, also interesting that. Uh, you know, employment actually went up in the groups with basic income, and it went down in the control group with fifty dollars per month. So again, like it doesn't make sense to say that it somehow made them lazy. Um, you know, they're they may be homeless, but they're not lazy. When they have this floor, they're actually more able to find jobs. Besides being more able to find housing. I would also say there's a lot of nuance in that probably isn't fully explored in terms of work in, in the more as opposed to not just jobs. Like, yeah. so the people that are getting fifty dollars a month or nothing or whatever the cohorts are, yeah, fifty dollars a month, they're having a lot of work thrust upon them by all the other programs that they're applying for and all the other things they're having to do that isn't measured by how most people think of as work. Like it's a job where you're getting paid by an employer, you're doing a thing and you're actually running in circles trying to stay where you are. And that's a lot of work because that's what we, that's what we put people through when they're in that situation. So that I would, I would guess that the people getting $50 a month are, are actually doing a lot more work in certain ways that is just very frustrating. Like, life maintenance admin type work yeah um a couple other a couple other uh findings on this too i just wanted to cover real quick before moving on is that selling blood plasma went down by 60 percent for those getting a thousand dollars a month and 500 dollars per month and it went up 17 percent for those getting 50 dollars per month and it, that's the kind of finding that i just never see mentioned you know in anything about the denver pilot um clearly if you have to sell less blood plasma then you're doing better and you know if if it's if you're if you're selling more that's that's not a good thing that's not what we want you know if you want to donate but blood Scott, plasma, where are great. we going to get all the blood <laughs> plasma we need who's going to give us the blood plasma if they don't have to do it to survive you know you haven't you haven't thought this through scott I'm like <laughs> yeah that reminds me of an, of another finding from the um, from Sam Altman's pilot too is that there was more giving that went on. So that's what I immediately think of is that you know people got a basic income and they actually donated more of it. They gave it more to friends and family and stuff. Right. And so yeah, like we saw that too. That's what uh, I expect more of. We had a guy who had a lot of had a criminal record and had a really hard time getting a job and like a lot of the work he did was never recorded. Like he was one of the hardest workers I've ever seen. Like. We followed him around for a day, collecting bottles and cans several times. And by the end of the day, like we had to sleep for a month 
Um, and he would just go on and do it every day. He, so he, it didn't get easier for him to get like official employment. But one of the things he did, um, it involved a lot of giving. Like one of the first things he did, it was winter time and he went and was like excited to, you know, buy, buy Christmas presents for his, for his family that he hadn't ever been able to give Christmas presents for as like the person on the street. And he also, um, would help out a lot of the people in the city. He was sort of like a mentor to a lot of people on, the, on the street. Like, here's how you collect bottles and cans. Here's a system to do it. Here's how you can actually get by. Um, and he, so he did a lot of teaching, uh, about basically survival skills to anyone who, who wanted it, you know, like he, made himself really useful, not just to himself, but also to society and to other people. He took a lot of pride in his, uh, in the collecting bottles and cans thing is like, I'm helping save the earth. You know, I'm helping get more stuff recycled. Um, I'm playing a vital role. There's, And if he was in some sort of pilot program that was studying work, they wouldn't give him any credit for any of this. Uh, but he worked harder than yeah. anyone I've ever met. Uh so one more thing from the Denver pilot, I just wanted to to mention too, which is the the effect on uh, drug use. And so again, we just talked about the impact and how it it really reduced drug use among men um, in the uh, open research pilot, and in here in this um, pilot focused on homelessness, um, those in getting a thousand dollars per month. Um, and these aren't, you know, statistically significant, but it's still interesting, I think, to me to see, because if it, you know, if the opposite was true, then you would definitely see st statistically significant findings of increased drug use and stuff. But here, you know, there was a there was a slight dip um, with $1,000 per month, and then there was a slight increase in the $500 per month and $50 per month. And again, these aren't s statistically significant, but we did kind of it meets the general uh finding of that in general you do see this slight reduction in drug use overall uh across all participants in these basic income pilots the next thing is um what's happening in texas and so this just happened this is like brand new news um for those who, who don't know what's going on in Texas, um, Ken Paxton, the uh, you know attorney general there, sued to stop a uh, pilot from happening in Harris County. And uh, they won that lawsuit. Um, so, you know, the, the judge agreed. And uh, so in response... The uh, pilot uh, organizers uh, decided to shift this from being like a cash-based pilot, you know, um, like an actual unconditional cash, uh, to kind of more like SNAP, because uh, Ken Paxton's argument was that you can't use public money to, um, you know, give like no strings uh, cash to. Um, to people, uh, they said that violates the state constitution of Texas. And so they responded and said, well, okay, instead of unconditional cash, we'll basically do vouchers and say, you know, you basically have to only use this on food and stuff. You can only use this on stuff we approve of. And, you know, that's no longer a basic income pilot, but they do just want to use this money to help people. And so he just did, he's suing again. And he's saying that they can't do that either. Um, like basically at this point, he's, the argument is you can't use public money in order to help people in poverty. Like that's basically what they're saying now. Um, it's just like a, a completely anti or pro poverty kind of position, um, for them to be, for them to be taking. It's really frustrating. Yeah. This is so what we've been talking about today, too. I don't think there's a whole lot to say about this other than it's despicable. Yeah. Um, this makes me want to talk about like what we're working on outside of just talking about things, um, like what we're working on with our different projects, because it it speaks to like what we're 
what we've been putting together and what we're hoping to release next year speaks to a lot of the issues that we've been talking about, about, you know, leading with stories rather than intellectualized data. And then all these pilots that are limited by scope, by philanthropy, uh, by government, governmental attacks uh, and lawsuits and things like that. Um, so yeah, should, should we get into that? Yeah. I mean, might, uh, might as well. So let's yeah. get into it. Um, yeah. So, um, so Scott's been long-term like UBI news agglomerator or whatever. Well, the way I came into the movement was through the docu series, and um, that as well as commingle that that Josh and I are building, um, are are sort of like uh, it's all about bringing real, um, scalable, experiential. Uh, stuff to the movement like so far we've done these one-off pilots are across the movement that you know it's once they end it's like okay now what or especially in the in the light of like uh people suing to stop these sorts of things and like fighting with the political sphere um what we're trying to do is one use the docu-series and the stories which we have uh, thousands of hours and two and a half years of really compelling stuff to get the word out in a in sort of a holistic way to essentially a captive audience if you have people watching for eight to ten hours because the stories are super compelling um then we can bring a, a better understanding of what ubi is and then for the people who are excited about it uh commingle serves as this option it's a web platform to essentially do a crowdsourced ubi among anybody who wants to um so the call to action for anyone who actually wants to do something about it is going to be join commingle. Like we're, we're, we're doing a UBI ourselves. Not only do we not have to rely on philanthropic funding or the government to make sure it goes, it can go permanently based on just what we're all chipping in with each other. Um, it's not susceptible to, you know, some dickhead saying you can't do this with government dollars because we're not doing it with government dollars and we're not forcing people to vote on it. Uh, we can get one f tiny fraction of a percentage of the country to decide they want to try it with us. It'll be the first permanent scalable UBI in history, and it'll be the biggest UBI pilot in history. And that's what we're trying to build in the next year is next generation real world implementation and uh, of basic income in a way that we can really model it for the government and a much greater understanding of a basic income by taking it out of this like little spins and headlines things and really connecting to real people in America getting a basic income. Uh, and we're on track for spring, summer 2025 to be releasing all of these things. Um, and that's part of the reason why we started the It's a Foundation, Income to Support All Foundation. Um, maybe you should talk about that, Scott, because that's your baby. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, we, we started the Income to Support Owl Foundation recently. Uh, it's a foundation.org. Uh, the goal is to support ambitious projects uh, focused on UBI. And the first two uh, major projects are Bootstraps and Commingle. And um, yeah, we are um, hoping to even to, to use uh, Bootstraps and Commingle as an example of the uh, projects we're looking to get off the ground. Um, but then we're also hoping that we can um, leverage these tools uh, as tools to actually um, really just get UBI going to some small degree uh, directly in communities and um, you know, utilize bootstraps um, in order to also encourage people to uh, just sign up for Comingle and start start spreading that in their communities and start growing that uh, so that, you know, we're we have an ambitious goal of uh, hopefully getting over a hundred thousand uh, people um, at least by the end of next uh, or the end of, end of 2026 or we, uh, to get a hundred thousand or within a year of launch is what we've targeted yeah. within a year and of launch, a hundred thousand people with a you know, small yeah. permanent basic income floor. Yeah, the the first permanent basic income for 100,000 people. So imagine one of these pilots, but it can grow and anyone in the community community can join and it never ends. And no one can shut it down because what are they going to say? Like, it's like 
all of us deciding what we're going to do with our own money with each other. Uh, yeah, all of these lawsuits, like Ken Paxton's, it's it's about public money, um, and it, it's it, if you're just purely doing private uh, donated dollars, uh, you know, charitable dollars, then there's no there's no stopping that. Republicans also aren't going to stop that. Conservatives aren't going to, you know, be against that. They're for, uh, you know, anything that isn't government. Um, you know, utilizing the power of the private sector and things to voluntarily reduce poverty. And yeah, that's what, uh, you know, to the, that, that commingle is looking to do is to actually enable people to just opt into doing that. And we sort of come at this humbly and ambitiously at the same time where bootstraps is not about advocating. It's about testing UBI, kick the tires, see how it goes. Let the people decide for themselves. And commingle is not about forcing or pushing it. It's about testing it, whoever wants to try it. And uh, if we make the mechanism work and we, or uh, as we tweak it, we find something that's really working as policy, uh, there's, a, there's no reason it couldn't grow like, like any other web platform to have millions of people and be lifting in millions of people out of poverty. So we're trying to build a system that can actually grow rather than just be a one-time demonstration. Um, and we'll be looking for anyone who's interested to join us. Yeah. So if you want to help out, you know, go to it's a foundation.org. Uh, now is a great time to make a donation. Uh, we have a matching funder who's matching $500,000 and um, we'll be doing a, um, a kind of, kind of splitting that up so we're the the first like trance of mat the tranche of matching is is just at the end of this month so if you um anyone who donates now that will be doubled um in a very uh quick turnaround um for us to make sure that these projects um stay on track i want to make clear too that both of us hate doing fundraising i've been doing it for a long time and i hate it and uh it is actually a very important time. Like what we're trying to build with Comangle and it's a foundation is it's self-generating machine that actually has an ongoing revenue source at scale. Um, so the, so right now it's more about bridge. Like as we come to the end and releasing things, we have this few months, we got to keep the lights on and the development of these projects, both post-production of the series and development of the platform where we have potential big grant coming in that we have to get to without shutting down. So this is a very specific moment in time where, you know, if we raise 20,000 in the next few weeks and turn it into 40,000, that gets us there. That gets us and keeps us on track to launch in mid 2025, at which point um, we're, we're sort of, we're sort of cruising at a larger scale and we, and we don't need to do this because, uh, most of what we've always done with our newsletters in this is just bring information and talk about the ideas. Um, and that's what I want to get back to. <laughs> Let's go ahead and, and wrap this up. Thanks for everyone for watching. Um, we will edit this together into a completed episode, just like the first one. Uh, uh, when it comes out and you're watching this uh, on YouTube as a finished edited episode, you know, thanks. Uh, please like, and subscribe, leave a comment. And, um, if you are wanting to watch this live, then we actually usually do this on on Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. Uh, oh, uh, BI for Farmers says, when does the docu series go live? Hopefully, uh, middle of next year. What really happens is, so we're raising the funding to actually just do it ourselves uh, before getting picked up. So eventually, we'll go to get picked again to get picked up by a Netflix or an HBO or something. And then it depends on their scheduling. Um, so we can't say for sure until that happens. Um, oh, BI for Farmers just donated. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah. Thanks for everyone for, for listening. And uh, we'll see you next time.